Disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent. Listener discretion is advised. And here we are on our second episode of October 2022, and what better topic to talk about, especially with Halloween approaching, the world of horror movies. And I have a great guest on the show today to talk about that. He's a cinematographer, a content creator, and hosts a podcast himself. My friend Joshua Sterling Bragg is on the show today, and we are going to talk about his podcast, Haunting Season, and its subtopic, Horror Talk. And hopefully by the end of this episode, you are ready to unwind and get your scare on. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Caught on the Mic. Ladies and gentlemen, it is no secret that Halloween is my most favorite time of the year. In recent years, I have rediscovered my love for horror movies. As a frequent user of the TikTok app and Instagram, I'm constantly being fed things via the algorithm that feed those interests. My next guest, I came across a couple of videos reviewing some fantastic movies recently, and I was like, man, I gotta have this guy on my show. Joshua Bragg, how are you doing, my friend? Hey, I'm doing great. You've already got me scared mentioning the algorithm. (laughs) Right? (laughs) How have you learned how to manage that? I don't. I don't manage it at all. I manage my hopes and dreams and my emotions. I go to therapy. I, I do not try and figure out the algorithm. It just is what it is. It's a wild, wild, dark beast. You've had some recent success on TikTok. How long have you been using the app? I should start there. Oh, um, I think I got on February. So this coming February will be two full years. Yeah, and I think that's when I started using it full time, like every single day. And we'll get into the minutia of what you're using it for and horror talk, uh, part of your haunting season. But let's introduce you and let's talk a little bit about your origin story for a little bit. Sure. How far back do you want to go? How far back do you want to (laughs) go? Well, where I typically start is the beginning of haunting season, which was 2013. Uh, I started as a YouTube channel to explore writing. Actually, it started because a coworker was like, hey, no one's really doing horror stuff on YouTube. We should get in there. And we kind of brainstormed a name. And he was like, what do you want to do? And I was like, well, I had a couple of um, interesting, maybe paranormal experiences in high school why don't I just talk about one of those? And he was like, sure. Um, And so we just threw it up there and it got like 27,000 views in 48 hours or something like that. And we were like, whoa, we're on to something here. So I had two more stories. And then when those were done, (laughs) you're like, I guess I got to start writing. And that's when I became like a horror writer. Have you been a horror fan your whole life? I have, but not like, I don't think I knew that about myself. Like I know in middle school, my brother, like anytime my parents would go to, my dad was a volunteer firefighter, ambulance guy. Uh, He's a minister. So he also volunteered for like the police squad. So between those, um, he was always out at some sort of like dinner, like, like maybe twice a month. And so anytime they would go out to one of those dinners on a Friday night, I would turn off all the lights in the house and make my little brother watch horror movies with me. And that's how it all started. When I realized that it was going to be like a real thing for me, other than just like scaring my brother and proving who's like, you know, the bigger man or, you know, whatever ways we thought back then Um, (laughs) was when I saw the ring in the movie theater, I think the ring and signs came out roughly around the same time. So I don't know which one I saw in the theater first, but I know I saw both of them. And that's when I got hooked to the feeling of like, that opening weekend the big crowd like everybody's shrieking together and then going home scared but i still didn't really talk about it all through high school all through college i was in musical theater um through both of them and uh yeah then i guess in college i fell in actually it was my senior year of college i started acting in senior thesis movies 
And then once I graduated, I had to come back for one extracurricular credit, which is, you know, bullshit. Um, <laughs> but it got me back to college for a semester to direct a show. And while I was doing that, a friend of mine was doing his senior thesis, which was a zombie movie. And so I was the assistant director on that. And I got to do a cameo. And I think that and hanging out with Anthony was like he was showing me Evil Dead um, and I don't know, a bunch of other movies like that that were outside of what I knew. I knew like modern horror at the time, the early right. 2000s horror, but the 80s horror he was showing me was like blowing my mind wide open. And I think after that, between end of college and my first job, which is where I started haunting season, was when I was exploring all of that like really aggressively. Yeah, I. Glad you brought up 80s horror because I tend to view that and I'm sure as a lot of people do as like the golden age of horror movies like you ask anybody who's their who's their entry level character and they're probably going to tell you Freddy Jason or Michael Myers most mm -hmm. of them are going to say Freddy just because of the humor aspect of it but like who would be an entry level character for you. Well, that's funny. It, it was Freddy because that was the only slasher I watched when I was a kid. Um, I think my brother and I, at some point when I was in high school, I like was like, we got to do it. Like, we got to do Freddy Krueger. I've been hearing about him my whole life. I had a friend in elementary school who was obsessed with Freddy Krueger, but I just couldn't do it. And he had the most amazing, um, amazing haunted house on Halloween. And his parents would do up the whole yard and the dad would chase you with the chainsaw. And there'd be like a dead body hanging from the tree house. And the basement was done up like Hellraiser with like syrup everywhere and like hooks from the ceiling. Um, and I didn't know what any of that stuff was. I just knew it was scary. Right. Um, but yeah, I wasn't into slashers. So I watched because I, what I expected from them was that they were going to be gratuitous violence for the sake of violence and that there would be no story, no fun whatsoever. And I was, you know, really appreciate fun in, hand in hand with horror. So I avoided them and now I'm watching them all for the first time. I would say my entry level is just something that would shock people. It was the Lou Ferrigno, Bill Bixby, Incredible Hulk TV series. And now I'm about <laughs> now I'm about to date myself because it was fresh on TV when I was like three or four. And I used to watch it on the couch with my hands over my eyes, watching between <laughs> my fingers because I couldn't handle whenever, you know, Banner turned into the Incredible Hulk. And I mean, look at where we're at now societally, but you fast forward to the mid eighties. Freddie was my jam too. And I have the same exact story as a kid that lived across the street from me. His family would go all out. They would do the whole haunted house thing. Dad would chase kids that were trick or treating. So that's a really funny parallel. Well, yeah. Where'd you grow up? Uh, <laughs> Albuquerque, New Mexico is where well, I was living when that happened. Honey, I was in uh, Malvern, Pennsylvania. <laughs> nice. Nice. So what's one movie that as you got older, that really kind of, we all have that one that kind of hooks into us and just gives us that experience unlike any other movie like i don't want to say your favorite movie but what's one that's moved you in a way that any other movie hasn't before well the ring is one that i always come back to and that that's my like rainy day comfort movie if i'm like feeling sick and i just want that like warm blanket i call it warm blanket horror um it's one that i feel like i can wrap around me and feel better because i'm so familiar with it but I think the one that really got its like hooks in me that changed everything was the thing because there's so there are so few cosmic horror movies that rise to that level. Um, I can think of maybe like The Void is a more recent one. Um, I don't know. You know, there's like a handful, mm -hmm. if that that are that he can even touch the thing so that's kind of what i'm always chasing i think when i'm going to see a horror film is like is that going to make me feel what i felt when i first saw the thing absolutely and mine was the exorcist and i saw that when i was like 13. oh man <laughs> yes and <laughs> i was i was reading the book in tandem with watching segments of the movie i didn't watch the movie the whole way through until i finished the book and I think as a 13 year old experiencing that level of blasphemy combined with the practical effects that were used in that movie, just it really kind of 
I, I don't know that I've ever seen anything that had the same uh, psychological effect on me since in the horror genre. No, that movie, that movie is perfect. I mean, start to finish it, it, the pacing still holds up today. A lot of movies from that time period feel really slow and boring. It, the pacing holds up, the effects hold up. Like some of it is a little kitschy, but that's kind of what you're looking for when you're getting scared shitless is right. for some sort of crack in the facade so you can breathe a little bit <laughs> but it's still a scary movie and it's still a great movie that you can sit and watch at full attention and not be on tiktok while you're watching it you know right i think we would be remiss to not mention the fact that you're a cinematographer cinematographer by trade you so almost said it was like it like it was the- cinematographer <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I, I'm not editing that out, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you're a cinematographer by trade. How does that impact the way that you view movies, especially older ones? I think it depends on how engaged I am in the film. It's like, I remember showing my parents movies when I was a kid. And if the, like, you know, if the sound was off a little bit, suddenly they were critics of, of films. They could like point out bad acting and bad camera work and, and all this stuff. But if the camera is like gritty, you don't think about it. If things are kind of soft focus, you don't really think about it as long as it's not throwing you out. So I feel like a lot of times, and I, I've let go of a lot because I remember when I saw The Conjuring for the first time in the theater, there was a camera move that... um it's like midway through the movie or maybe kind of towards the climax where it's on the top level and then it's going towards the banister and then it tilts down and goes downstairs. And there was a little bump in whatever rig they were using. And I noticed it and it took me out of the film, but it's because at that point in my life, I was like, like every single page of American cinematographer magazine, I was pouring over and I was like doing tutorials online all the time and taking online classes and just like pushing and pushing and pushing myself. So I feel like I was hyper focused on that. And now I'm in a place where I'm comfortable with my art and the way that I make it. And I'm not so self-conscious anymore. So now I'm watching other people's art in a much more relaxed way. So I don't, I don't have to separate those things all too often. It's more that I'm like, you know, maybe getting stuck in the idea of like, oh, I would have done this a little bit differently if I was making the film like as a whole. Right, right. But there's other movies kind of like the early Sam Raimi films where like some of those errors and some of those little glitchy things kind of actually add to the character of the film to a certain extent. Absolutely. And that's that's kind of what I want to do with my my larger projects that I'm planning on for the future. Um, I I don't talk about them in any specifics because I don't know what's going to happen first or if any of them are actually going to happen. Um, But there are film projects that I want to work on um, with a bunch of different people. And I, I want that imperfectness. I want the gritty, you know, I'm like, I'm not a fan of Rob Zombie. I love the way his stuff looks. I love the style. I love his filmmaking. I just don't like his storytelling. And I don't like the actors that he chooses most of the time. So I have a tough time with his movies. I, I, the reason I'm thinking about it is because I was watching Halloween 2 last night. Because I'm chronologically going through all of his movies to give him like a fair shake. Um but I, what I do love about what he does is that film grain and those like freeze frames and how it feels very seven late seventies, early eighties. Um, and that's the kind of thing I really, really like. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, he's, it's almost like his style in a weird way is almost a form of parody without being parody. Yeah. And I, and I don't want to, I don't want to use that term because I don't think that's necessarily correct, but I think that's the best way to describe it. Cause you think about the very first Texas chainsaw massacre. It's like, he used that as the blueprint to make all of his movies moving forward and then yeah, throws in yeah. a few quick cuts other than that. Yeah. A few quick cuts toss in like, like a handful of Pee Wee Herman, yeah. uh, you know, like, <laughs> yes there's just something like kind of like quirky and goofy about it but at the same time it's just like you're not cutting away from someone getting stabbed in the face for like four minutes yeah it doesn't it, for some reason it just doesn't add up and like that i know the new terrifier 2 movie just came out and i've been hearing a lot of people on tiktok talk about it i watched the the first well, two, because he's there's like the All Hallows Eve where you meet Art the Clown and then there's the full terrifier. 
I didn't like either of those films. I enjoyed watching the practical effects and thinking about like how how the hell did they do this? But the movies itself, they're just so um I have I felt the same way about the saddening, like just depraved for the sake of being able to put that stamp on it of yeah. like, you know, there, there's no fun in them for me anyway. See, I just recently revisited the evil dead remake from 2013. And I had yeah. a little bit of issue with that as well. I was like, okay, this took, this is This is gratuitous violence for the sake of violence. And it's not really moving the story forward at all. And I didn't feel like it was a really good homage to the source material. So I really struggled with it. I'm not saying I didn't like it. I mean, it was, it was an okay popcorn movie, but I did struggle with those same exact reasons. So I never had the connection to the original that most people had because I saw evil dead one with my buddy Anthony, I saw the third one, Army of Darkness, yes. like drunk at a party in the background. And so it was like, why are these books moving around? Why, who are these claymation characters? And I totally missed number two. And then in 2013, when that one came out, I just like meandered over to the theater and was like, sure, okay. You know, I heard this is kind of fun and was horrified. And so, that movie has a special place in my heart because right. it's one of the only movies where I sat in the movie theater alone and had both my feet on the seat and was hugging my knees and watching through my hands as an adult. Right. Um, I don't really remember the story. Um, and I definitely know that it's not like, like that. It's really taking the, like the elevator pitch of the movie and expanding on that. Yes. Um, but I recently watched evil dead Two in a hammock in the woods at night outside my grandparents cabin in the woods for the first time and you that was a trip. <laughs> that was a trip that was so much fun that is the way to watch it <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing that's that's masochistic right there man like my whole family was asleep and it was like 11 30 at night and i was like i'm gonna go sit in the hammock and watch a horror movie and i was like oh evil dead's like a cabin in the woods movie maybe i'll do that one that Ooh, what a great choice. I cannot believe that it has taken me 36 years to see that film. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So going back to Terrifier, do you yeah. think... Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Sentences you never want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> do you think it is because the iconography of people like Jason and Freddie and Michael Myers, why that movie has the fan base that it does, because I'm with you. I'm 110% with you. It, it didn't do much for me either. This creator, um, who I recently started following and I can't remember their name right now, but, um, they were talking about it on their page and he was like, um, he was like, Terrifier 2 came out. I ran to the theater to see it. And I got to say, this movie is perverted. It's disgusting. It's the type of movie that they would only make in the 80s and you would have to go to the back room to get it. And the types of people that would watch this film are exactly who I am. And then he went into explaining why he loved the movie. And a lot of it was the the practical effects and being able to see them without looking away and the challenge of being able to accomplish that without having to have tricky camera angles um you know so it's like a filmmaking feat and then there's the like i guess maybe the not badge of honor but like maybe badge of like disgustingness um of being able to sit through something like that because the new one's like over two hours it's like two and a half wow. hours yeah and and he was like you know the the guy who made this film is just as like mind blowingly insane as art, the clown. And so the two, but thinking about it in like a meta kind of way, of course, an art, the clown movie being made by this director who created art, the clown, like they're going to just make you sit through endless, endless, endless torture because that's like the point of the film. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, sense. yeah. And, and like, I think it's good for people to push boundaries because I think we don't push as hard. I, I don't know if you saw studio six, 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 not yet. Um, it's amazing. And there's a kill in that, that um, without giving anything away, pushes the limit of what you thought you signed up for, but it's still fun. And I think that scene doesn't exist without terrifier for some reason and and it's specifically because the kills are similar but this is done in a more campy way 
Um, but I don't know, like, if anyone would have thought about it if Art the Clown things that he did. Maybe maybe that's like trying to solve an impossible problem, but you know, I don't know. I kind of believe it. Like if we don't push the boundaries, then we never get anywhere. Right, right. Great segue into where I was going next was you talked about getting into horror in the early 2000s, and it seemed like there was a renaissance that kind of started then and then it kind of stopped or slowed down for a while, and now there's this new age of horror film that's really driven psychologically more than the sight gags and the practical effect effects it's more about jump scares and the work that's being done in your mind you just recently saw smile mm -hmm. and i just recently saw barbarian have you seen barbarian yet yeah oh my gosh and like what you think you're getting versus what you get are two totally different things and judging from your review of smile it's kind of what you think you're getting versus what you get two totally different things yeah yeah the, the i think smile was the smile fits into the same category as the ring so it's kind of that like warm happy place for me from when i first started loving horror it's got the jump scares but it's also got sort of the mystery and you've got to like you do some detective work and figure out the clues um the ring does it far better than smile does smile like i don't want to overhype smile it is a very you know sub genre movie it's very specific it's jump scare it's like you know but what i loved about it was that it um it took what you would assume, which is that the whole movie would just be like, all of a sudden, everyone's smiling everywhere you turn, there's the smile, there's going to be a like a shot down the street and like everybody's smiling. But it's not that it's way more nuanced. And it's way more specific to the character whose journey you're on. And that I just felt like that was surprising to me because I expected it to just be a junk movie, you know, and just like go and like right. laugh at how bad it is. But no one was laughing at the end. My friends were like, that was terrible. And I was like, nah, I don't think it was, you know, and it opened up a good conversation. I think that's a perfect landing place for a jump scare movie. So what is your favorite subgenre of horror? I gotta say it's cosmic horror because like I was saying before, it's something I chase. Um, but it's also because I think at that like where i was trying to figure this out the other day i think i fell in love with science fiction first and then i fell in love with horror and then i found out that they could be together yeah. and that's like such a special place for me if there's like outer space involved or the future in any way i love like i grew up watching star trek and then to watch the technology that they had on the show turn into technology that i have in my life like ipads and apple watches and and like being able to talk on the phone through my watch or my phone or uh, you know it's i love thinking about the future and like am i going to get that am i not going to get that am i going to experience this are robots going to take over you know like elon musk just put out a robot that looks like you know the beatles could have recorded their first album on it just like i thought it was so unimpressive but it's a step in that direction while everyone else is focusing on the metaverse. So now we like, I don't know, things are just expanding and looking far, far, far in the future and the way people's minds work envisioning that is, is like my happy place. And you're right. It's like science fiction is becoming science fact more and more frequently. And so to throw a horror element into that makes it that much more exponentially terrifying from yeah. that extent. Cause I have the, I have a similar effect with found footage movies. I love found mm. footage movies. Absolutely love them. They can be as horrible as can be, but I still <laughs> love them. You know, <laughs> but what's your, what's your like top, you know, what's your favorites? So I like the very first VHS movie. Mm -hmm. I like that one. Um, I did really, honestly, it's not well known. I wish more people would watch it. Hell house LLC. Yeah. I loved that one. Um, and of course, you know, I, I think the OG, the, the original Blair, Witch, it mm -hmm. does stuff for you psychologically that first time at least first time viewing it it does things for you psychologically a lot yeah. of movies don't yeah i've been exploring found footage a lot recently um it was something kind of i i like i liked it when i first discovered it and then you remember when like cloverfield was coming out and everybody yes. was like oh the camera shake makes me sick but i really think people were just saying that because they heard somebody else say that you know yes because yes. i didn't feel that way i felt like cloverfield was like 
a cinematic version of found footage. And I'm like, I've watched way shakier shit than this and not gotten sick. But I did go through a lull like with everybody else where I was like just not paying attention to them. So now I'm going through and like one of my favorite things to do is I'm I'm in Boise, Idaho right now for work. I travel a lot for work. And my favorite thing is to close the curtain, shut off all the lights in a new hotel room that I've never been in and watch a found footage movie. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so the one that I did in um in Kenya was um Ganjam Haunted Asylum. And that one blew my mind. Have you seen that one? No, I have not. But now I'm going to. <laughs> it's a Korean film. And basically the setup, without giving anything away, is um, a group of live streamers go into one of the top seven most haunted places, as said by CNN, um, to do a live broadcast. And their goal is to make money by getting a million viewers. And so because of that, certain members of the team have rigged it to look like it's really actively haunted. But then <laughs> oh, I love <laughs> that to happen. I yeah. And the acting that. is just superb, like top, top level acting, which I, I feel like in a found footage movie is hard to find. Um, yeah. Cause I feel like a lot of like grave encounters and stuff. My main complaint with it is like, well, I don't believe that these people are real. Yeah, man. I love that because one of my very good friends, he's been a podcast guest of mine a couple of times, is the caretaker of the Velisca Axe Murder House in Velisca, Iowa. Which oh, is, my buddies were just there. Yeah, it's one it's one of the most haunted places in America. And the second episode of my podcast, we actually recorded it in the Velisca Axe Murder House in the bedroom. So in and, and true story, like, I don't care whether p people believe or not. I know I'm sometimes on the fence. It is the only episode of my podcast where I have had to edit everything line by line because I had volume spikes go up, go down, go Whoa. up, go down. And so I am utterly convinced that something was screwing with us because we were sitting in there. Yeah. So, uh, when I was doing the previous version of my podcast, um, I had my buddy Mike on because he posted something. So he, his story in short is that he was an urban explorer who had a paranormal experience and had never thought about ghosts ever before in his life. And suddenly th it turned from urban exploring to paranormal research. And it's just him and one other guy and they have their own separate channels on YouTube. They like, they share footage, but they tell their own story of being there. So he's really just this one guy and he had posted something about having like the most upsetting, disturbing experience ever um, on one of these ghost hunts. And I was like, come on my show. I want to talk to you before you even like edit your footage before anything. Like I want you to talk to me. And so we did an episode that was like an hour and a half of him telling being in that house for one night. And it, it, I honestly believe that he was possessed at certain points during that night because he like would be doing things and it would, like trying to convince his partner to like go to sleep in the beds. And he'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, we're just getting started here. And they would have to go outside to clear their minds. That place, I will never set foot in that place. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> there are certain things I will not do. Uh, buy, like actually interact with a Ouija board and go in the Velisca excess, you know, however you say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, what's, what's crazy is um, there is a former insane asylum about 40 miles away it's called malvern manor that mm. allegedly the paranormal activity there has increased more since the paranormal activity has you know grown at the Velisca house it's it's crazy it's it's really fun to listen to people in southwest iowa talk about that yeah my, my buddy mike said he does not believe that it is a human force that's in there no it, it, and johnny like Johnny, you know, he, he talks frequently about how, you know, he's done his study on it and he's like, he puts up forth a disclaimer and he's like, you know, it's tragic what happened to the people there. So he doesn't want to make light of that, but he's looked at moon phases, seasons, everything to try and determine what churns it up. And the only thing that's kind of consistent is the visits. 
Like yeah. the more frequently it's being visited, the more like things get churned up at the house. It yeah, it's spooky, man. Yikes. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of that's another one of the feathers in your cap, too, is a little bit of paranormal investigation, too, isn't it? A little bit, yeah. Not um well, so early on it was kind of I think it was like 2014. So it started haunting season 2013. 2014 I had never really been on Twitter and someone was like, Hey, you should be on there. And I was like, all right. So, so I got on there and like, one of the first things I did was tweet something like, um, I'm writing or something like that. Or, and then someone else was like, what are you writing? And I was like, haunting season duh, or something, you know, like I had no idea how this was working. So that person ended up being, um, someone from Minneapolis, and she's a writer and she has a group of writers called ghost stories, Inc. They're all children's writers and they all do their own stuff separately, but they get together and do ghost hunts for inspiration um, to, to help fuel their creativity. And she was like, come out to Minnesota. And I was like, well, I got a cousin there and I haven't visited her in a long time. So sure. <laughs> and at that point in my life, I had kind of like this thing where like people would invite me to do something. And like, no matter what it was, I was like, yeah, all right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> put me in some sticky situations from time to time, but it was fun. But one of them was, you know, meeting this group. And so I went out there um, to document them and to just visit them for one night and go on a ghost hunt. And it was so fun that I ended up going on like 12 of them with them and just flying back and forth to Minneapolis for like two years. That's awesome. That yeah. is fantastic. It was a lot of fun. So as I said, at the top of the podcast, we are in Halloween season right now. And this is the time of year where people start watching more horror movies. They invest more time in the icons of horror movies and the icons of Halloween. What would be your top three picks for movies that people might not have seen that they should check out this Halloween season? Oh, man that um well anything for jackson is a big one that i always pull up that's that's a legitimate scary one um about it's basically this older couple who's dabbling in um extremist satanic cult sort of stuff um they kidnap a woman who's pregnant to try and bring back their dead grandson through the birth of this baby Oh, wow. Um, and because they are not trained in these rituals, it doesn't go well. So that's a really good one. And there's that has elements of like the shining to it, but also kind of like hereditary a little bit, but maybe not nice. quite as like deep and dark and heavy. So that's a really good one um, for like, I might go past three because it's hard. That's all so right. The, the two kind of like comedy level ones one i always suggest is um jack brooks monster slayer it's got robert england playing a creature um and uh it, the whole premise of it is this guy can't control his anger and so therefore he but because his parents were killed by a cyclops in the woods he can't control his anger and he like tries to go to therapy but he's just too angry and so he can't get his life together and basically some crazy shit happens and there's monsters everywhere and he's got to like learn to conquer his anger and use it for good. It, it's hilarious. I'm doing a terrible job selling that one, but it's hard <laughs> to talk about it without giving too much away, but it's got awesome practical effects throughout. Awesome. It's only practical effects. Um, and the other comedy one would be um, another all time favorite of mine is um, behind the mask, the rise of Leslie Vernon. Do you know that one? Mm -mm. So it takes place in a world where Freddie, Jason, Michael are all retired and it's time for a new slasher to come out and, you know, take, take their, you know, reigning, take, take their stab at being the next like big, big thing in the slasher world. And so this guy, Leslie, who's inc incredibly personable, very, very likable, um, invites this documentary crew to follow him and, and in his preparations for this. And so it's extremely funny in the first half, but the further you get into it and the more that you're in his world of like being the slasher, it turns from mockumentary to cinematic. Oh, and wow. so the further you get into the movie, the further you get into being in a slasher film. I love that concept. It's 
awesome and it's done so well and you will just absolutely fall in love with leslie vernon cool all right that's that's three i feel that's like three. i could probably keep trying to pull more but <laughs> those are always top of mind those are like some of my three top always recommendations awesome so let's touch on your podcast haunting season you're focusing on horror talk and you're creating content for TikTok. So let's talk about that real quick and let's kind of plug that. Yeah, I have the thing is I have a lot of hobbies and like within the horror world where I really want to get to is telling my own stories through in a in a cinematic way. I want to make films. Um whether they're short films or feature length, I don't care. I just want to make horror movies. Um but you know, it costs a shitload of money. So when I started my podcast, well, so when I started my show on YouTube, I was writing scary stories and I was putting full audio design behind them with, you know, pretty much surround sound. Um, that, and I love, I have, I just have a deep, deep love of audio design. So I did that for two years. Then there was like a seven year hiatus. I, you know, lots of life changes. I ended up finding my job out in, in Los Angeles. And we're all filmmakers from New York. So we were like, oh, let's um, let's pitch like entertainment stuff now that we have our like, um, you know, we, we do a lot of like pharmaceutical videos and like medical right. stuff. So we're like, wow, that's running by itself. Like, let's get our foot back in the door with entertainment. And my channel, which I had abandoned for seven years, still had 17,000 followers. And some people were regularly being like, dude, you alive? So... <laughs> <laughs> And so I pitched it. I was like, what if we brought that back as a podcast? We've been doing a lot of podcasting. Um, you know, I think that could be really cool. So we brought it back. And because I couldn't, um, because I couldn't write all the time, we came up with this structure where we're like, okay, we're going to do like talk show three episodes in a row, and then you're going to do a story so we can keep up with the story thing. So I did that for like a year and then it, TikTok started to take off. And so that was a whole nother focus of like a lot of time and energy because it's writing, editing, you filming, like all that stuff on my plate. And then trying to do a, like a weekly podcast on top of that. And then having a full-time job, it just was getting to be too much. So we like kind of stopped the podcast and we're like, all right, we're going to focus on TikTok. So we did TikTok for a while. That went really, really well. And then my bosses were like, all right, we want to think about the next big move how do we get there? And so I started scripting something for them. And when I wrapped that up, I started having this idea. Actually, it was another TikToker who um, had posted online. He was like, if I just, if I just did a podcast where I talked to other TikTokers, would anybody watch it? And I was like, I want to do that with you. That's a great idea. Can we do it? And so he and I, Andrew Horror, um, started talking about it a little bit, but he had some life tragedy going on and and had to focus on other things and gave me his blessing. And I was like, I, I, you know, I'm just going to go with it because it sounds like something I could maintain. And so that's when I started. It's still under the name haunting season, but I'm calling it horror talk, like the hashtag TOK. Right. Um, and it's just talking with other TikTokers about what they love about horror. And they don't have to be a horror content creator. They just have to be a TikToker who I know. Um, and then, and that's been really great. I have like 10 episodes recorded, um, that I did all in like two weeks. And then now I can kind of sit on the back burner while they're being edited and focus back on TikTok and writing the bigger stuff. Absolutely. And that's, there you go. We started off talking about algorithms not too long ago, but having all of that stuff kind of backlogged sure does help with the algorithm a little bit because you have endless supply of content now too. Yeah, well, and that's what I do with TikTok too, is I, I, anytime I watch a movie, I open my notes app and I just write a review, write that in there. I'll look at it one more time right before I put it in my teleprompter, but I will film sometimes between 15 and 20 TikToks in one go and have them all on my computer. So I can like, if I get a burst of energy edit like five of them, or I can do them day by day if I want to, or if I get super ahead, like I am now, I have like 15 drafts. I have like 35 of them filmed and I have, um, I think like 40 of them written. So I'm in a really good place and I'm like terrified to lose that, um, <laughs> that like gain. But I know once the holidays hit, I'm going to want to be with family and kick back Dude. and all that. Oh my gosh. Tell me about it. It's like the <laughs> whirlwind of life. You can be like in such a role as far as content creation goes. And then the whirlwind of life just interrupts you one day. And the next thing you know, you're a week and a half behind and you're like, 
damn it i didn't post my required two videos a day <laughs> well that's a wild thing too about being a filmmaker for a living is i never know where i'm gonna be when i'm gonna be there right i kind of just follow my producer around and they're like hey we're going to boise for two days and i'm like cool it's in my calendar so sure you know and then i just follow like because i'm not doing i'm not the one booking the flights or like making all the plans i'm just like all right grab the camera let's go um and I don't know, you know, like I was in Africa for a month and, and I didn't really have all that much time to prepare for that. It just was like suddenly happening. And then on top of that, because I am in a high up position at my company forward looking <laughs> as far as like getting the money and getting the projects and all that stuff. I mean, we're already talking about what's going to happen at the end of 2023. So these right. months go by in a flash. I have no idea what month it is, what day it is. It just is like all of a sudden October. And I'm like, Oh, Oh, uh oh, <laughs> I'm the spooky guy. And it's October. Now, how much of that life moving in like an extra fast pace moving like the flash, um, do you feel is a result of life post 2020 and post the pandemic? I actually feel like things are significantly slower now um, because I, I, I got in with these guys as a freelancer when they were just freelancers in New York. And so like New York is a pace that's unmatched by any other city, right. especially if you're a filmmaker, because I was living like an hour outside of Manhattan and taking subways and lugging your gear and everything. I mean, it's just grueling, torturous days. And you're just living in a little shoebox with a bunch of roaches. Like I'm, I know other people have different experiences in New York, but that was mine. <laughs> <laughs> I was so glad to be out of there. Um, and then moving to LA, things were like a little bit slower, but the, the, the pace of work was the same, but like driving, driving to work instead of on the subway, like you, it just doesn't feel like mass chaos all the time. Um, I don't even remember what the question. Oh, yeah. I guess like I was also in my 20s. So things were just like it was like life or death. It was like, am I going to make rent or not? And I think now that I'm a little bit older and approaching 40 and, and my wife is 40 and like we have a house and dogs and like a car and a job and I travel. Did we hit that two years of sitting on the couch and working remote. And it was like, it was never going to end. It was like every single yeah. day was like, how is work like 15 hours long today? That's a, that's a really good point because when you were in the thick of it, it felt like the world was moving like molasses for me, for me, I'm on, I'm kind of on both ends of the spectrum. So I, I can relate to what you're saying in some eras or some areas, it felt like everything slowed down in other areas. It feels like everything is sped up in hindsight. So given all of that and given everything that you do, what's your advice for making the world a better place? the way you see it right now go to therapy um <laughs> that was the greatest thing i ever did for myself i feel like before before i ever went to therapy i was in a, always some sort of spiral about finances about i don't know how i'm going to solve this problem about so and so at work said this thing and i can't stop thinking about it or I had this dream and it's about my parents and i can't stop thinking about it and through therapy, you know, I was just able to learn to embrace the changes and to embrace the differences and to not expect anything from anyone other than myself in a positive way, not in a like no one fucking does anything, you know, but in a, in a way where it's like, if I want to see change, I need to be the change and to adhere to that and to hold yourself responsible for that. And I think that if we all we're given the gift of being able to look inward a little bit more like that. We'd be able to interact with each other in a much more kind way to understand like, Oh, this asshole who honked at me and is now trying to break the window of my car is probably dealing with something other than me hitting the brakes a little bit too hard. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes, man. I tell you what, I have had a blast talking with you. I had a blast talking with you yesterday, uh, through Instagram, Ladies and gentlemen, you can find Joshua by searching out Haunting Season on Instagram and on TikTok. You got any final words for everybody? Uh, watch a whole ton of spooky stuff. 
I don't know. <laughs> and happy Halloween. <laughs> Man, thank you very much for doing the show. The world's a better place with you in it, my friend. Oh, I appreciate that. I'm sad this is over. It went so quick. <laughs> it did. What a great conversation with Joshua Bragg. Fun editorial note. I did not know how much time he had earmarked for the show. We probably could have gone on another hour or so. I know he was on a shoot in Boise, Idaho. What a fun conversation. I just wanted to respect a busy guy's time. Hey, check out Haunting Season on all forms of social media. Give them a follow on TikTok and Instagram. Horror Talk is his new podcast, which is a branch of Haunting Season. While you're giving people a follow, make sure you follow Caught on the Mic on all forms of social media, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. And follow me at www.caughtonthemic.com. This has been Caught on the Mic with Michael Clark. I'm Michael Clark. Until next time, thank you. <laughs>